I started my previous upload of Max Egan part one I had trouble mixing it and I got bored I looked in the uh, spam and I found the documents for the nightcap community and the interesting thing is while I'm waiting for other things to to finish tonight I've watched Max Egan's current video um, which I'll bring up a, a clip of it later on where he's, he says something that is very contradictory about uh, living there in this place forever when that doesn't seem to be the intent with all the documentation in the email that came through from the Nightcap community realtor rich moat and uh, all the information that he gave me towards the subdivision the council planning uh, this statement of um, you know protocols in the community and he refers to it as Gunham's land now in the past video I introduced Gunham and in 2012 this is when Max is said to have moved in to the Crow House here but he's already known Gunham for 10 15 years don't know exactly and we know this because of the interviews that he did with Gunham to promote the property that um, is I'll get into details a bit anyway but I'll just um, Now, if anyone's watched a Max Egan video lately, you'll know this is his standard format. Starts off with the peacocks, ends with the peacocks, or actually uh, a clip at the beginning just to get you in the mood of feeling depressed and what gruesome thing that the man has got in store for you. Right now, he's actually just saying he's got nothing really to say. <laughs> And then he just goes on to tell you how bad it is and, you know, blah, blah, blah. But um, the whole purpose of showing you this is because I've brought it up in the video where I got... Um, Max didn't like me talking about him. He's apparently a little bit of a hypocrite when it comes to being honest and... There are more than one version of truth out there. According to Max Egan, there is only one truth, and it seems to have been that for a fairly long time. And he likes this uh, Tartaria um, mythology, the mud floods. I never heard of any of it until Max Egan. And, you know, I'm kind of thinking a lot of that is tied into the flat earth theory as well. It's all psyops. But uh, I, I don't know. I'm not going to investigate it because ultimately what e each and every one of us has to understand is that, yeah, I have studied history since, yeah, like Max tells his little story, before I could pick up a book, any book I could, um, well, before I could pick up a book, before I could read, I was looking at the pictures and then when I learnt to read, I remember how wonderful it was because now I could actually find out about those pictures and I felt so much more grown up. And uh, I just poured through anything and everything. Mum had plenty of books at, at home that I went through and I also, through school, went to the library and looked up the things that I wanted to. And, yeah, there's a certain element of... Um, what he says about rebellious to the teachers, yes, so was I. I was very rebellious, but I was also very quiet because I didn't want to get kicked out of school. I didn't need any more grief in my life because contrary to what this guy was experiencing, I was having real experiences that showed me that the world was larger than we, we knew it was. And grown-ups couldn't explain it to me. Uh, why did he start looking? Because it, for the poor little boy, was oh we we can't own who yeah 
your own land what you know and he's hated on the world ever since you know spend alone some time with oh yes here we go reinforcing some more fear um alone some time with his teddy bear talking to him and saying you know ask god why i was born in the wrong planet i mean it's an all woe 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 victim story mentality where there's where there's a victim there's always got to be a perpetrator and this is where he keeps instilling the victim perpetrator mentality so as long as you feel like a victim you can actually have someone perpetrate something upon you and what if that someone is actually Max Egan this man takes in a lot of money for refusing the system in Australia he now gets people to survive he gets ordinary people to donate money and most people can't afford it it's all set up so that there's no way of well he thinks there's no way of client tracing it back to him and and showing that he's been receiving income that he's never declared he's talking about an election that's coming up in Queensland that he'll never vote in he's never voted in and he never will because he doesn't participate now he's walked all around the yard here you can see that this is where Max Egan lives in the crow house you know this is where he lives now I'm just gonna stop that for a sec take back a bit whoops too far all right see that porch there you'll see the ladder going up that goes up to that um, platform on the the roof or a veranda or deck you know on top of the roof that you climb up uh, that was also another distinctive feature in the video that Ma uh, Max <laughs> Max got me censored on and got it pulled down off YouTube um, one of the distinctive features about um, locating where this this particular house is is the um, deck on the roof and you can see the stairs going up the other distinctive features that I mentioned were this uh, stand of trees uh, palms here now I knew on Google Earth you could only see 2016 but that doesn't matter because those palms are old enough that they've been there for more than six years and then as you swing around the yard there's also the identifying buildings there's also the the hill behind the buildings where there's um, a thin stand of trees but it's light on the other side so that's indicating a cleared area it could be low bush but I assumed it was probably pasture or it could have been even small cleared area for cropping but certainly there was no bush on the other side so and then by looking because he walks all around the yard um, you can get a perspective of how these things are located now as as he's walked from around in front of the main house here because he lives in the garage that's where the crow house is in uh, a previous video he walked past that bin and I saw a number on it and I told this story in the video that got yanked down so I'm going to tell it again because uh, but I won't give as much uh, detail here so that I'm not infringing on poor Mr. Max Egan's fake personality and endangering him because you know I mean who am I endangering him from anyway I mean the government knows where he is they not only know where he is but they know his false name and his real name and what is he hiding from his adoring fans <laughs> or people that he's pissed off and burned you know all those people that got sucked in and conned and lost money because they believed in his story and uh, the the Ken O'Keefe scam was a bit to do with that but then again you know I know that Ken O'Keefe's questionable but I actually think that uh, Max Egan had 
<laughs> more of a profitable experience out of the money that was taken than what Ken O'Keefe did. I think um, Ken O'Keefe actually found out just how easy it is. And, uh, you know, I know what, how, how these people thieve. Um, I've told that story about how the uh, Alan Hamer that I met in the other community just down the road from um, the Nightcap community that um, Gunnam and Max are thick as thieves in. He was, um, in my things, he stole personal documentation and my mother's jewellery. Now, my mother's jewellery was only sentimental. And as far as documents, you know, like, I don't even look at them as anything other than I need them at certain times to, to get a bank account or, you know, show ID or something like that. And I got copies of them again. But, you know, they're only a piece of paper. And that's all they're stealing is a piece of paper with a number on it. So what if you know who I am? So what if you know that I was born Kerry Robinson, you know, on the 2nd of January, 1965, who my parents were? You know, so what? You know, that's me. And I've lived a fairly um, <laughs> full life when it comes to experiencing a lot of different things. I left home when I was nearly 19. And uh, I'm, what, 55 now? And I've experienced, what, 78 different addresses in all that time. I've done a lot of moving. And I tell you, there at one stage I was moving with not only one household full of contents and a husband and two kids, two cats and two dogs, but uh, a container load full of all the things that mum had left me after she had died so I had you know so many moves so much stuff and the more stuff you have the more a burden it is and I don't recommend that you acquire too much but I'm getting off subject here because the subject is Max Egan right now so I've uh, given you a few identifying features about the property. You also notice too that um, there's a curved driveway that has to come into play to actually know the location of where this place is. Now I'm not actually going to tell you where it is. Um, so you know there's no reason for anyone to think that oh I'm endangering his life or that um, you know <laughs> as I did in my previous video. Is this revealing the location of the back cave? So what? You know, it's not real. And the location of the Crow House is a fictional place, just as Max Egan is a fictional character. So if I happen to go for a ride on a 748 and go down a certain road and wave at a fictitious place, you know, who knows? I don't know who the real person is there. I could easily quite find out though, because uh, of his date of birth, and it makes it very easy now to narrow it down to, well, the, I'd start in Adelaide at births, deaths and marriages, and if I didn't have any luck there, I'd go to Queensland. So, you know, the thing is that ultimately there's not too many people that are born to Pauline and Bill, and let's assume that he gave out his real parents' name. Now, he talks about his uncle Maxwell Cotton. Now, I'm assuming that if that was part of his real last name that he wouldn't give it out. But then again, if he's Uncle Maxwell, it's probably because that's his mum's brother. So... His mum was probably Pauline Cotton and her brother was Maxwell Cotton. Well, this is only just uh, playing with the, the facts of what he's given out as far as who he says he is. But that's only, you know, <laughs> when you can't verify a person's identity that they actually exist, they can be anything they want. And as Max Egan tells you over and over again, I can tell you anything. 
<laughs> I can tell you any truth you want to hear. I can explain it any way you want to hear it. But no matter which way he tells you, he's always going to put a negative spin on it so that, well, quite frankly, researching and listening to all of this it does nauseate me. The constant negativity is very heavy. That's why, um, you know, I'm not going to give up until I've finished giving all the details and explaining the whole story. So there's, there's probably a few more videos left. But this one I wanted to focus on this uh, person that's living in the Corumban Valley in Queensland that uh, is hooked up with Gunham or Mark McMurtry and the Nightcap um, village and the Nightcap village development uh, according to the plans which I'll show you um, is nearly 4,000 acres and it looks like they're extending more. It's quite an elaborate setup. And without the benefit of knowing from the videos that uh, I found on YouTube that were of Mark Darwin and Adrian Brennock at the Freedom Summits, uh, explaining how it was all set up and even the connecting um, company that is supposed to be the public face whereby all the others are hidden behind, which is Wollumbin Horizons is the public face that can be seen. And the Bulla Bulla Village, which the next phase over from that was the Mount Warning Eco Park, but even that still you couldn't connect it back to the Bulla Bulla. And this is all explained in this, um, I suppose you could call it investors meeting that they held in Nimbin that um, Mark Darwin and Adrian Brennock did. And it's the same setup as Nightcap. And with all the searching through, you can actually see that it is still the same people, even though uh, Gunham has already said, oh, no, 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 it's, it's the same, you know, some of the same people. Yes, yeah, some of the same people because more people have joined since then, haven't they? And considering how many more people have joined since Max and Gunham did their interview back in April and another one in August with the overwhelming responses that they've had, I'm wondering how much of a finder's fee Max Egan has earned himself. And we'll get into the finder's fee because... That's also mentioned in the uh, judgment summaries of the Supreme Court. That's mentioned in the Nightcap documentary that Adrian Brennop brings up. And he, you know, seriously, I wouldn't like to meet that boy face to face. I don't think uh, I'd be welcome into the community, put it that way. <laughs> but anyway, I'm just going to bring something else up here for a sec. Okay, this is a little image from my uh, previous video, bringing Max into the backyard of where he, he videos, where you just saw, you know, where here's the um, Maloka, Malokala or whatever you call it. It's because of the shape of it. Uh, it comes from another country. I had to look it up. I didn't even know. What it was i thought he might have been talking about the tp type ones but um so this is uh, an interview done with um gunham mark mcmurtry back in april 2020. now i want you to look at this image before i bring up the next one because i have actually introduced the next one because here is mark mcmurtry on the front porch of the place where Max Egan lives and <laughs> it actually looks like Max Egan's walked out into the yard and Gunham's just got out of bed 
and he's sitting there having his morning coffee and he comes up and he goes, mate, do you want to do a video? And he goes, oh, not now. And he goes, oh, yeah, you know, raw's good. Yeah, you can almost imagine him saying that. So, yeah, Gunnam just looks like he's he's got out of bed. And he looks very comfy, you know. And they don't even say, oh, well, thanks to, you know, the, the, the people here that we're sitting here and doing this, that and the other. So... You know, no respect to the owners because, well, maybe that's because he's sitting with the owner and he doesn't need to pay respect because he's just gone up onto his mate's front porch while he's having coffee and just said, yeah, let's do this video. Okay, I have to have a little bit of fun. Uh, you know, I couldn't help but put the Batman one in because every time I kept looking at these two, all I could see was Batman and Robin. You know, here's his, here's the rich Bruce Wayne, <laughs> and uh, Dick, <laughs> Dick Grayson. <laughs> you know, he, his poor buddy. Yeah, you know, and you could imagine if they were old now, that's what they'd look like. So yeah, I grew up with old Batman and Robin on the TV, okay? I even started seeing them in black and white and, you know, all, it was just so corny. I mean, to... <laughs> but that's why I thought it appropriate because, you know, that's kind of around the age, or no, it's a little bit uh, older than that, but... So, ultimately, associating the Batman and Robin characters with um, Max and Gunnam in the way that I have, and over here, I brought in the fact of um, Dave Onigs, who came in to visit and do a video. And he even made mention in the video about the secret location. And he gave this little grin as if to say, oh, can I say anything more than that? Or should I have said that? And um, so I want you to pay attention to that. You've seen Max sit on there. If you've watched his videos before, that's a the front uh, porch part of that little rectangular building and he sits there quite a bit and uh, that's where he's sitting with Dave. So if someone comes to visit the house, to visit Max, they don't sit on the front porch here like uh, Gunnam does. Gunnam's got, well, more pride of place in it, hasn't he? So you can see that guests of Max's don't go up to the front house. Now if you look at this video here that was also done of Mark in and um, Max in April, you can see he's very relaxed. I mean he is just making himself at home. I mean, you know, he actually is either a very arrogant person, which is, yeah, probably an also, or he doesn't, he's not arrogant, he's feeling at home because he is at home. And then after my last video that Max got banned, well, he said that he's passed my name on to the owner, and it's like, well... What do you boys expect to do with it? Because um, <laughs> you're going to have to... Max Egan has got a fake name. He can't take any action against me because you have to be a real person. So maybe if he, he gets his Batman involved, you know, Batman will come along with his bevy of solicitors and accountants and planners and direct developers and all these other people that he knows and you know get rid of his problem you know try and bully me and intimidate me and get a solicitor at least to make a bluff phone call to me but even then does Gunham want to put his name up with Max Egan to stand up for and admit that that's where he actually lives. 
So you see, it's kind of like a catch-22 with it all, isn't it? That uh, you can't do it, can't have a go at somebody because you don't legally exist. And those that do, well, Batman's got a pretty big, rich stake in it. This property here that... Um, this was bought back in... Oh, I got it wrong last time. I think I said it was 2001. It was actually 2002, I think. But it was... Um, hang on, I'm going to check it. Yes, it was December 2002 for 190000 So that property has been there in the hands of the one owner since the... Uh, end of 2002 and Max moved in to the Crow House in 2012 now Gunham uh, associated with the Nightcap community and the video uh, looking up the purchase price of buying back the uh, property that they lost through the receiver auction and they had to rebuy it back basically because the contract had fallen through the um, sort of rent buy contract so gun and bought back uh, the property or reacquired the property uh, for two million dollars gun and bought that two million so, you know, this property that uh, the Crow House is at is in the Corumban Valley in Queensland and that cost him 190000 Well, if that's where he lives. <laughs> well, someone he knows very, 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 very well lives there. So well he makes himself at home. More at home than what Max Egan is probably because Max doesn't live there, he lives in the shed and he doesn't want to, you know, encroach on the alpha male's territory too much. I mean, it is Batman and Robin. And Max being dick. <laughs> I thought that's so appropriate. I couldn't remember what Robin's name was. I knew it was Bruce Wayne. But it's like what was his real name and as soon as I looked at it it's like of course how could I forget that because every time he turned around and he called him dick it was like the way he said it you know it was just yeah so you've got um, these uh, two that are very closely associated they've known each other for 10 to 15 years and now I think it's time to go on to the um oops what's gone there so ultimately the uh location of this fictitious fictitious place called the crow house that um this fictitious character called max egan lives in is somewhere in the corumban valley in queensland and me giving out the location, well, putting all the um, evidence that he provides online about where he is, um, I was able to locate it. And yes, after I think it was about five days before um, it got removed <laughs> under terms and policy. And what terms and policy would that be? revealing the location of a fictitious character that's like saying i revealed the location of the bat cave and i endangered batman oh sorry robin well i did endanger batman because batman lives there too doesn't he but i'm going to get into the community now at nightcap so I just did the uh, next part on the community and it turned out to be over an hour long and I thought it better to 
uh, end this here and upload the hour one separately because that's only a summary that's not even detailed uh, and uh, I'm going to put the clip of Max Egan's show from tonight which would be what uh, September 23 2020 and uh, in which at this point in the video he's just said that he's got no intentions of moving anywhere and of course you know at the end he'll say to you you know thank you to all the people that have been you know sending him emails and supporting him and you know he's he's now not overburdened by emails and that you can um, start sending him more and don't forget those donations as well because any support is appreciated <laughs> Now, if you notice that this is the very same porch that Max Egan is sitting on that Dave Onig sat on with him because that's where guests sit in this little place where he sits. He walks around and does his videos and doesn't interfere with the main house unless he happens to be doing a video with someone at the main house, of course. So... Um, I'll leave you with the end clip of um, Max's latest show. Um, I haven't got my screen record and everything figured out. I was going to just randomly go click, 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 click through and let you listen to what he talks about because by the time you get to 11 minutes, I mean... Look, I'll just give you a, a quick through on the images. All right, walks out into the garden. It's all doom and gloom. He's talking about, you know, oh, it's bad. Control. Doesn't know what to say. And then, oh, look, look, all oh, horror and terror coming in. And, oh, bad, yeah, bad. Oh, more bad things. Bad, bad, yeah, more bad, bad, bad. Oh, but what can you do? What can you do? Really? What can you do? They're going to attack the babies soon. And why? Well, he's got all these nice images coming up. Come on, maybe they're after that. Let's get him up a bit for further. He's got all these good looks on <laughs> He looks like a bloody garden gnome half the time. <laughs> I don't mean to be unkind, but he does. Where's his one of little... Danny Hunchback, as he calls him. Oh, there's plenty of pictures of him in the Danny Hunchback. It's probably because I've... Yeah, recording in it, the video hasn't caught up with it. Well, anyway, you'll see it in there. Just take notice and um, see how you feel after you've watched it, if you've been positively uplifted. Now, you know, every time he coughs, he's got a smoker's cough. You can see all the smoker's stain around uh, his beard, um, very obviously tarnished. I mean, he doesn't care about smoking in front of the cameras at times too. And every time he coughs, he goes, oh, COVID. I mean, it's like, yeah. Seriously, no, smoker's cough. And he talks about having a sore foot, you know, because of the colder weather. Now, back in um, the beginning of the year, do you remember he broke his foot where he said he was going down the steps to the clothesline and slipped on the stairs? Now, it's been pouring down with rain your clothes is going to be so wet on the line that only an idiot would have put them out there. And even if it was building up to rain, it would be so humid that you'd probably have to put it inside under a fan to dry it out anyway. And you certainly don't stick it out in the sun. It fades your clothes so quickly. But you see, um, others had pointed out that he couldn't have 
Uh, let's see if we can get back to an image of the... Oh, look, there's Danny Hunchback. See there? He presented all those images. Where are we? Go back, Max. Oh, look, there's the babies. Seriously. Oh, oops. Okay. So it's not the best shot, but it'll do. Down behind are the stairs. He's supposedly walked down these stairs, slipped in the, the torrential rain, going down to the clothesline to get his soaking clothes. And as he's doing it, because he's going to Anarchapolco and he needs dry clothes to pack in his suitcase. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? He slips on the stairs. Now, I've slipped over and recently, well, a couple of years ago, I broke my scaphoid in my hand and I've had problems with it ever since because the most natural thing when you are falling is to put your hands down and there are certain things that are going to hurt um, if you are falling and especially if he's falling down the stairs um, if he didn't fall, fall, even if he fell forward, he'd put his hands out to stop him. If he's falling back, he'd put his hands down to stop his fall. So no matter what, your hands are going to have something to do with it. But he says he smashed his, his foot open. Now when he did his video on his Comfrey Miracle Healing, you could see that he did actually have swelling in the foot. Now to get x-rays done without any Medicare and all the thousands of dollars and everything that it would have taken to get the the x-rays, the hospital to service, you know, the, the doctors, uh, painkillers, crutches, moon boot, all of that. But the thing is that he certainly didn't do it by slipping down the steps. That damage to his foot is very recognisable for someone that has kicked something and hurt their foot doing it. And um, <laughs> I know this because uh, at times, you know, I've kicked something because I thought, oh, damn, and I've just sort of kicked out to just sort of kick the bottom of something and it was like, oops, okay, that wasn't very smart. And then I, um, yeah, spend a little bit of time regretting it. Now, mind you, that would have to be some serious... Um, kicking to do that to split open all the, the the way he described it his his toes must have been hanging off there was that many breaks and they were looking at putting pins in again um at what hospital with what medicare or no all that cash that you went down there and got all those medical bills in the the thousands and thousands of dollars did, you couldn't drive because of the foot, so did someone else drive you? Or did you call an ambulance? Because just calling the ambulance without any, um, you know, medical in, uh, ambulance insurance in Queensland, and you're not paying the electricity bill, so are they still billing it through the electricity? I don't know. So that would be an expensive trip for you if you didn't have to, if you had to pay for that. So all of these things that he brings in that just don't make any sense if you stop and think about it. I mean, yeah, look, it, even if um, I know that when I've been playing football, I've hurt my foot. You go to kick the, the ball and I kick it wrong, I always kicked it wrong and I always hurt my foot. Mind you, I didn't do to my foot what he did, but the only way you can get a foot like that is... To kick something and that's why the toes are like that is because they took the brunt of the impact of whatever he kicked but he can't tell you that because he's supposed to be this very evolved spiritual being with all this wisdom even though all he does is keep repeating the same fear and I don't want to leave you with that fear I just wanted to tell a couple of things too now another thing too that he says in this is that um Oh, I've been banned off everywhere. Like there's, I saw a video a couple of days ago from a guy from 153 or 
speak or something where apparently Max has claimed that he got kicked off. This guy was really pissed off because this is the guy that apparently, you know, is involved with it. And he said he's never even been on there. But um, in this video, Max talks about how um, he tried getting on Telegram and, you know, he made a big deal about getting on to Instagram, but because it requires um, a phone and you can't do it on your desktop or laptop or whatever, you know, so that's an excuse of why he can't do that. Then he gets into this, oh, then people sent me Telegram and I installed it. And then the first thing it said was, you know, I need to link it to my phone. Now, I'm going to tell you that that is absolute down outright bullshit. As soon as he said it, I knew that was bullshit because I've got Telegram on my laptop, my desktop. And I it never at any stage I installed the downloadable desktop application, installed it onto my computer, opened it up, joined the groups that had already sent me an invite, and it was done. I don't even have, a, like I've got a mobile phone, but at the moment it doesn't even have credit on it. That's because I don't use it, and it's like, yeah, well, you know, it's there. When I need to use it, I'll put some credit on there. So it's not a, a device for me. So when he says that you cannot um, use Telegram and that's just an excuse. There are lots of excuses with Max Egan. Lots and lots. But the thing I find very interesting too is that while I'm waiting for um, the screen record to open up because I was mixing the, the long <laughs> the hour long one that I was doing that I'm going to upload next I was watching the beginning I thought well look I'll just watch a little bit of this Tartaria and look after I watched about 10 minutes of it I couldn't handle anymore because I don't know it it just it starts out as first of all Tartaria is kind of like a play on Tartarus that's out of Greek mythology that's in the underworld okay and then um, he starts talking about the Tartar and I'm thinking, hang on, I remember that when I was a kid. Because, um, you know, as I said, Mum had plenty of books and she also had old books that people had given to her. And I've actually got a re some really old books that, um, yeah, I mean, if you want to know how to tan your own hide and live, how they used to live before any modern conveniences and do everything for yourself, they used to put out a yearly almanac with all the handy hints so people could do all these things for themselves. Now people shared their information. So but anyway, so um, these Tartar, I'd heard of them. Now I can't check back on those um, books because, you know, I had more books than furniture to carry around there at one stage and I had to get rid of them. And because the way I look at history is that Look, you can learn so much about the history and that's good and important to give you an understanding of how you get to where you are now. But so much of our history we are never going to know, we're only going to be able to guess at. So take from it what works with it, with it, us and move on and bring that knowledge that you learnt from it into the present. Because the history is something that cannot be changed. The past is just merely a reflection of what might have been or what could have been. You want to live more in the now moments where you can make choices in each moment that affect the future of not only you but all those around you. So you don't have to be constantly living in the past looking for the answers when you already have them just simply by the choices that you make and the emotional content that you you give in or investment that you put into something 
You know, when I was a lot younger, I used to get emotional about everything. And mum used to say to me, look, you're going to wear yourself out if you take on every cause. Well, she was right. You get to the stage where there are so many wrongs that you, are f you feel that are out there. You try righting them all. But you try taking them on from a perspective of um, idealism rather than realism. And I, I knew that it was not something I could achieve alone. That's why I went into alternative communities. But then I realized even they didn't have the answer. It needs to come from the whole evolution in the change of the mindset of humanity. And a lot of that is happening now. I mean, my daughter told me about um, a, someone she knows, her boyfriend's um, sister, who's actually 13 years of age. He's actually 25, but his sister is, um, no, it's his sister's, that's right, it's his nephew, his niece. So I'm getting confused here because, um, yeah, I've got issues with the boyfriend, so... But um, it was so, so ter terrible. She was telling me that the boyfriend's niece, she's 13 years of age, uh, about a month ago, she tried overdosing and killing herself. And then yesterday, my daughter told me that she's tried doing it again. And the thing is that her mother, the boyfriend's sister, is not able to give any kind of attention to the kids because she's working from home and it's all about her and her career and getting that done. And, you know, it's just... I these issues were existent before the lockdown, but... Um, it is, this is something that is really affecting people and nobody, I mean, the, the mental health system was already in crisis before COVID-19. And once COVID-19 hit, it's an even bigger crisis. And they are ill-equipped to deal with it because seriously, the mental health system needs to go and see a mental health system to get its head right because so much of what it does to people you know defining each particular quirk and and peculiarity about people as something that is wrong i mean so what we're not all the all the same you know yes there are people out there that uh, i would say are mentally unstable. I have met some of them. And as much as what they are like that, you know, like this one guy, Adam, you know, sometimes he drives me crazy and I tell him how much he pisses me off. But on the other hand, if someone's turning around and saying what a bad father he is, I'm going to turn around and say piss off because that's not the truth as I see it. And then Adam will come to me and say, well, thanks for standing up to me. And I say, look, I'm not standing up for you. I'm just calling it how I see it. And he didn't understand that. That I, you know, a lot of what I say to people isn't a personal attack. It's just the way I see it. And uh, anyway, enough of my personal stories. I'll, I'll end it here and say goodbye until next time. And it sounds like a, a nursery rhyme reading to my kids, doesn't it? Uh, <laughs> I'll think of something different to say. I'll shake it up a bit. And uh, I'll upload the hour-long one on the community. It's an introduction into the people involved in the community that Max Egan and Gunham are involved with and uh, how to get to the links of all the information and documents that I was sent th from the community or the realty, uh, Richard Mote. And anyway, 
I'll leave it at that, cut in this clip with Max and uh, yeah, upload the other video. And uh, yeah, catch you next time. Hey Billy. Sharing a bit of space with the chickens, mate. Hi folks. I don't really have much prepared today to talk about. I just thought I'd come and check in with everybody anyway. I think it's good to do that sort of thing. Keep it regular. I'm kind of sick of talking about COVID, to be honest. I'm sick of talking about this pandemic. But it's dominating our lives so dramatically and so drastically at the moment, it's hard to shift focus away from it, unfortunately. Things are getting worse and worse in Victoria. I mean, the legislation, the omnibus legislation that Daniel Andrews has introduced is absolutely outrageous. You know, being able to appoint anybody, they don't even have to be public servants, just anybody, you know. If you're an officer of the law or you're someone who is an appointed officer and you need no qualifications to be an appointed officer, then you can basically appoint anybody else to be an officer. And they can be given the powers of the police to go and arrest anybody on the belief that this person possibly will not be going to comply with emergency regulations or whatever, you know. And quarantine measures, you know, COVID guidelines. Just on the belief, on the belief that this person may not comply, a citizen can go and arrest a fellow citizen. Brown shirts on steroids, folks. It's, it's, it's unprecedented, this type of legislation. And once a person is arrested, they have no legal recourse. There's no trial. There's no lawyer. There's no one they can appeal to. They can simply be detained for as long as the person who is detaining them believes that they will continue to not comply. You think about it, you know, I'm going to arrest you because I believe you're not going to comply. And the longer I hold you, the more frustrated you're going to get and the angrier you're going to get and the more I think you're not going to comply, so the longer I'm going to hold you. You know, I mean, this is unprecedented. We haven't seen this sort of stuff since Stalinist Russia. Mao Zedong's China, Pol Pot, Idi Amin. They didn't write it down as legislation, though. They just did it. Daniel Andrews is literally writing it down and calling it legislation, and people are going along with it. The police brutality in Victoria is just over the top. One guy just questioned, you know, about the masks, you know, the mask legislation, mandating the wearing of masks, which is bad for your health. One guy apparently just asked the question, you know, why do I have to wear the mask? And the police reaction was just over the top. I mean, you ask a question to the police these days, and the response is that you get six armed men, thugs, jump on you, beat you to the ground, drag you off and put you in a cage, and you have nothing that you can do about it. Probably issue you with a fine. If you're issued with a fine, I mean, if this guy is issued with a fine, absolutely don't pay that fine. Challenge it in court and say, hey, I simply asked a question and I was set upon by six armed thugs who beat the shit out of me, threw me to the ground and dragged me off and put me into a cage. And I'd like to know how this is construed as law in any type of morality or any type of mind that calls itself human. It's ridiculous, folks, absolutely ridiculous. And this is just the beginning. You know, what they're doing in Melbourne is going to come out everywhere. <coughs> COVID, folks. Look out, he cleared his throat. It's COVID. Bit of COVID in the foot today, too. It was a little cold last night. 
I find where I broke my foot, a little bit of COVID comes out in the foot in the colder weather. But yeah, it's coming everywhere. You know, the Chinese model, they had to find a way to bring it into the West and make it believable. Victoria is simply the stepping stone. Also, there was a statement made by Daniel Andrews in 2017. I think it, it may have been a tweet or a Facebook post where he mentioned something about, and I, I'm paraphrasing here, I'll put it up on the screen for you to read, but he mentioned something about the people of Victoria are all going to be participating, or all the babies in Victoria will get a chance to participate in an unprecedented medical experiment for the first time ever, and it's all being run here in Victoria. And here we have 2020 and 2021, and we've got all the babies in Victoria are currently involved in an unprecedented medical experiment. Yeah, folks. But, you know, it's, it's just finding a way to bring it into the world, bring it out into the West. And Victoria is the stepping stone. But you look at what they're doing in Victoria, the social crediting, the curfews, everything they're doing. Look at the health passport they're bringing in in Ireland. Look at the rule of six they're bringing in in London, and they're talking about locking the UK down again. I don't know if they've done it yet, but they're talking about it. There's other countries as well, such as, um, I think, Paraguay, Panama. I'm not sure how Ecuador is now, but Paraguay and Panama, Peru. A lot of countries are really in a, a brutal state of lockdown. And there's lots of people talking about the second wave. I mean, there wasn't even a first wave. And I'm expecting it to come to Queensland. They've opened the borders a little bit. They've expanded the border bubble. These terms, mate, the border bubble. Yeah, and so a little bit further south, people from New South Wales can come into Queensland. People from Byron Bay and Ballina and stuff can come into Queensland. Now, they'll use this as a, a means probably to say how the virus came to Queensland. We have an election in Queensland next month, a state election. And I guarantee that if Anastasia Palaszczuk gets elected again, she will lock the state down, or at least sections of the state down, the way she's locked, or the way her parasitic cohort in Victoria has locked down Melbourne. And Melbourne is just, you know, it's like, this is like Kosovo or something, folks. It's un unprecedented what's going on in Melbourne. You know, Melbourne has gone from what they described as the world's most livable city to 1984 and Brave New World on steroids in the shortest amount of time I've ever seen anything happen anywhere. It's absolutely unprecedented. And Dan Andrews has gone completely insane with power. Just got to look at the guy's eyes. Photographs of the guy recently, he's, he's got that wild-eyed look happening, you know. He's just... He's a psycho. He's a completely psychotic individual who has lost all grip on reality i'd really like to know what data he's using to justify this lockdown as well your tail's getting pretty long there billy because the data that he's using i mean it's certainly not cdc data it's certainly not world health organization data i'd like to know where he's getting this data from Seem to be just lotto balls, folks. How many deaths can we make up today? That's what it seems to be. Over the next couple of months, like through October and November, I think we're really going to see the ride begin. And I think everything that we've seen up to this point has simply been in preparation for that. And I think that's what we're going to see in October or November. It might be the 5th of November. Remember, remember the 5th of November. Could be a good day to do things, you know. Wouldn't surprise me if they were to pick a date like that. I don't know what it's going to be, though. But it's going to be something unprecedented. 
It's only it's going to make 9-11 look like a walk in the park. I don't even whether it'll be a terror attack or anything like that. I don't know whether it'll be any type of war. I don't know what they're going to stage or I don't know what is actually coming. But something really big is coming. And as I've stressed so many times, you know, we get to a point where you've got to really see the writing on the wall, folks. I mean, it's a huge opportunity it's a time of huge opportunity for freedom but i think this system has to completely crumble before that's ever going to happen they're really pushing to create their whole technocratic new world order and a lot of people will go into that but you know i can't see how it's going to survive i really can't but the only way it's really going to not survive is through some major form of upheaval I mean, you want to know how to really stop the whole thing from coming online, how to stop this whole control grid in its tracks right now. Like I said before, folks, shut down the internet. Think that's going to happen? Of course it's not going to happen. I mean, the internet's been great. It's, it's done wonderful things. We've had access to all sorts of information. I couldn't be talking to you. You know, I've met so many people around the world. I've traveled to so many places, lecturing, done all sorts of things. You know, I wouldn't be living in this little place that I live in if it wasn't for the internet. You know, it's just a little rental that I live in, but hey, I'll be living here forever, I would say, folks. I can't envisage myself ever moving from this place. You know, it's done wonderful things for us, the internet, but by the same token, we've given our dependency over to it so much, and it is becoming such a controlling aspect of our lives. And now with this whole technocratic tracking system that's coming online, well, it's just, it's set to become even more a controlling aspect of our lives. You know, and if you shut down the internet and shut down the televisions, the whole pandemic could go away. All we'd have would be newspapers then, folks, like it used to be in the old days. Newspapers, possibly radio, you know. And uh, be an interesting world, wouldn't it? You know, if we didn't have the fear campaign being generated by the media, which is just over the top fear, 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 fear in every aspect of our lives, most of the problems in the world would go away. I mean, you know, when you're, you're kind of there in your space, I mean, out here, I wouldn't even know that there was problems with the world. You know, I don't realize it until I go into town. And then even when I go into town, most people I talk to know it's, it's a fraud. There's only one person that I've spoken to, and I speak to everybody, every shop that I go to, and I go out almost every day. But every shop that I go to, I talk to people about this, they go, you know it's a fraud, don't you? And they all know it's a fraud. I got some new glasses a couple of weeks ago, and um, the optometrist knew it was a fraud. You know, this is pretty out of left field. Everybody I speak to, there's only been one checkout operator who said, oh, you think? And by the end of the conversation, she actually was starting to, to agree that there was a few aspects that maybe she should look into. So that's kind of comforting. By the same token, though, how are we ever going to stop it from just coming online if we've got this huge media spin being driven? I mean, even if everybody thought it was a fraud, if the television tells them that, oh no, everybody believes it's real and the opinion polls say this, and so this is what the government's doing, and people are happy with the government's response to the pandemic, then all the people who think it's a fraud are going to think, well, shit, everybody around me thinks it's real, so maybe I better not say anything. But they don't know that. It's just the media telling them that. How do they know any of it's true? I mean, nothing the media tells you is true. Why would any of that be true? You know, so if you are awake, I mean, don't think you're alone. I mean, I, I get emails from a lot of people who say well my parents think it's real and you know my family thinks it's real don't despair though folks because there's a lot of people who don't and look at the u.s revolution the american revolution it only took you know one percent or three percent or something there's some ridiculously small amount of the population to win the revolution so it's not over yet the big problem, as I said, is the breakdown of the food chain, because even if people do wake up, 
if they haven't got these supplies in place and they haven't sort of read the writing on the wall and got themselves ready for what's coming, well, you know, like I said, we've got to get to that point where we see the writing on the wall. We realise a lot of people aren't going to wake up. A lot of people will, a lot of people won't. But however it goes, we are most definitely heading for unprecedented times. We're heading for unprecedented food shortages, whichever way it goes. Even if we stop the system right now, even if all the Q-tubers were right and the children were really being rescued from the sewers and we were really winning, you know, all of the food chain is breaking down and it's still happening. I mean, even if, okay, so sorry about the vegans, but for all the meat eaters out there, there's an abattoir, I think, uh, just west of Brisbane. Well, they just put off 600 workers the other day because someone tested positive for COVID. It's meat production. It's food for people who eat meat. And the farms are breaking down. The, the, the vegetables aren't being grown. They're not being picked. You know, they're, they're culling the chickens in Victoria. They've just burnt out all the forests. They're breaking down the food chain, folks. It doesn't matter what you eat, whether you're a vegan, whether you're a meat eater, whether you're a vegetarian, what you eat, whatever it is you eat, they're making sure that that's going out of production, okay? Abattoirs, farms, grain storage, rice production. They're saying Australia will run out of rice by Christmas time. They're already saying on mainstream media that people should prepare for a very different Christmas this year. They're not going to have the amount of food that they would normally have. You know, so through all of it, folks, we've got to realize that this is happening. Even if the whole world was to wake up, realize that this is a, a provable fraud that's being run here, and we were to pull our governments out of power and put new people in charge, well, we've got to get the food chain back up and running pretty damn quickly for it to make any real difference at all. That's what a lot of people aren't noticing through all this. And that's one of the reasons I think they're making the lockdown so brutal everywhere. So that's the focus that people have. They're not looking beyond that. They're not looking at the bigger picture. We're heading in for unprecedented times, folks. We really are. You know, everything we've been warning you about for the last, you know, the last 13 years that I've been on air, all the stuff we've been talking about, well, it's here, folks. The train that I've said is coming. I've said to so many people, you know, if you don't stop arguing over your belief systems, don't stop arguing about the shape of the tracks, the train's going to hit. And when it hits, there will be no warning. It will be sudden. And that's what we've got, folks. We've really got that. So, you know, like I said, it gets to a time where you've got to face the writing on the wall. I mean, even with the stuff I've been saying about tribal law, we, we have an opportunity to do that in this country. And like, like I said, all you've got to do is find wherever you live. You don't have to, it's not about buying land. It's not about, you know, anything. It's just about finding the tribe where you live and treating with the local lawman and stepping back into tribal law. But even if we do that, you know, when you see the level of brutality that's being meted out to the people by the police, these people have no respect for any type of law. They're not going to respect tribal law, you know, and ultimately they're the one with the most powerful guns. So where do you go from there? You know, without a huge mass awakening, it doesn't matter what law you try to step into. I mean, tribal law is, a, is an option if you can get somewhere on tribal land and, and treaty with the tribal people. And in most places, this is going to require doing something like going to Arnhem Land or something like that. I mean, you know, it, it's a huge change of lifestyle for people. You know, it's difficult to do when you're living in the city. I mean, we could do it, but we need massive amounts of people to do it. And what people aren't even noticing through that, again, is the breakdown of the food chain. And so this is, I mean, all the remedies that I've suggested over the years, you know, the building of community, I've been saying for, for years and years, your most powerful asset is the people around you, your neighbours, because when we get to this time, if you've got a good connection with the neighbours around you, then you're all going to be able to stand together. You're all going to be able to support each other and we're going to be able to get through this mess. I've been telling people to grow gardens. You know, I've been doing all sorts of suggestions for so many years, but it's got to the point now you know, where we're heading for an inevitable conclusion and it's going to be what it is. There's going to be a whole bunch of people that go 
the way of the technocracy, there's going to be a whole bunch of people who don't. But again, there could be something unprecedented happen that stops all directions. So yeah, interesting times, folks, interesting times. You know, and what you've got to do at the moment, as I've said again so many times recently, is, is really look out for yourself. Look out for yourself and your loved ones. Make sure you're in a place of, of spiritual and moral high ground, you know, metaphorical high ground. I'm not expecting a flood or anything when I say get to high ground. It's just what I'm saying when I say get yourself to high ground is, you know, get yourself a supply of food. Get yourself in a position where you can kind of weather the storm that's going to come. And be prepared to spend a lot of time where you actually are right now. Don't be expect to be traveling much or even being able to go shopping or do too much at all. I mean, if you're going to need a health passport and all sorts of things to even be able to go to the local supermarket, well, I certainly ain't going to be going there. So, you know, we're heading for unprecedented times. It's just going to be interesting to see what's going to unfold in the next few months, folks. It really is. But yeah, just a bit of a bit of a sharing of thoughts today. Like I said, I don't really have a lot to say. I just wanted to check in with everybody, let you know that everything's okay. I tend to get emails from people and they wonder where I am if I don't post a video for you know more than about three days. And like I said, it's been kind of it's kind of weird because I'm sick of talking about COVID. But it's controlling so many aspects of our lives. You know, I mean, I'd like to talk about history. I'd like to talk about all sorts of things. I actually had a, an interview, a good interview with someone the other day where we, we touched on history a little bit. I did a couple of interviews on Instagram as well. I did one with Tristan, the guy who organized the rally in Brisbane. There's another picnic actually happening in Brisbane on the 10th. 10th of October, I'll be there having a, a picnic with Tristan and Dave Ognese. A few people have asked me what time it will be. I'm not sure. I think Tristan will be releasing a video soon. But he did an interview with me on Instagram. And I did another interview with Matt Lawson on Instagram as well, which is an interesting platform for me. I've got a page on Instagram, but I can't figure out how to actually share the interviews on my Instagram page. I've never even been able to figure out how to post a picture on Instagram or anything, folks. I can't see any means of doing it. I think you actually, it, it wants you to use a phone, I think. I mean, I've got, I go to Instagram on my computer and there's just no option there to do anything like that, to upload videos. It just tells me to get the latest app. But of course, the app is not compatible with my machine because it wants me to install it on a cell phone and I don't have a cell phone. So I find Instagram to be an incredibly dysfunctional program, but there's a couple of dysfunctional website, but there's a... Um, couple of interviews you'll find links if you go to the crowhouse.com and look in my radio archives you'll find a link to an interview I did with Matt Lawson I can't find the one uh, that Tristan posted but apparently it had quite a few views uh, I'm not sure of Tristan's last name offhand but there'll be a video coming out soon which will talk about the picnic that we're going to have in Brisbane on the 10th and I will share that for you maybe I'll send it out via an email or something like that like I said, I've never really been able to figure out Instagram. I can't make head or tail of it on my computer. I think it's designed more for cell phones. And I think a lot of stuff is designed for cell phones. Interesting, a lot of the programs people tell me to use, such as Telegram, you know, get off Skype, and I would love to get off Skype, um, and Telegram and places like this. But, you know, you need a cell phone to, to run them is the problem. Someone said, oh, no, you don't need a cell phone for Telegram. You can set it up on your computer. Here's a link. So I downloaded it and I installed it on my computer. And the first thing it asked me to do was to link my computer to my cell phone. <laughs> I thought, well, there you go. You know, the reason I'm downloading it for the computer is because I don't have a cell phone. Doesn't this kind of defeat the purpose? So, you know, I think a lot of this stuff, folk, it's, it, it's all about getting you trapped into the grid, getting you dependent upon this stuff. And when you look at what they're going to do with the cell phones, look what they're going to do with the, the health app on your phone. If they can get this hydrogel into you through the vaccines, I mean, where are they going with all this, folks? It's, it's next level stuff. It's, it's really next level stuff. So, yeah, I mean, it wouldn't be great if there was an EMP or something from space and all the technology was fried and there were no post-70s vehicles and no post-70s technology at all. Wouldn't that be an interesting world to fall back into? I think if we did, 
we'd suddenly find that the entire pandemic went away. Wouldn't that be incredible? But anyway, folks, I'll leave it there for now. Thank you for the incredible amount of kind emails that I get from people. Uh, the emails have slowed down a little bit now, which is great. And I can get a few more emails now if you want to send some to me. And thank you to all my supporters on Patreon. And just thank you to everybody who continues to you know, spread this word. That's the best thing we can do, I think, at this stage, folks, is spread the word. And stand tall, stand strong. You know, stand up in the face of this, folks. As I've said before, we're about to be tested. So, you know, we have to be able to face what's coming without flinching and just stand our grounds. And that's what I intend to do. And in a way, I mean, I'm kind of glad I'm here for the big finale. I'm glad I'm here for the final event. Imagine if I'd done all this research for my whole life and then I missed the big event at the end. That'd be a drag. So, yeah. No stake in the outcome, folks. Interesting times ahead. Stay safe, stay strong, and I'll look forward to speaking to you again soon. I'll be back in the next day or two, bring you another message. Hopefully it won't be about COVID, but hey, so I don't know, see what the world's going to do. But anyway, take care. In La Cache.